Okay, here we are, live once again. Technically speaking, everything seems to be in order. I've got to apologise first of all for last week's fiasco. It wasn't Derek's fault at all. Was it last week or a couple of weeks ago? Um, it was just sound problems, couldn't get in connected. So apologies if you did tune in for Derek Griffin. Um, we have got a new date for him, which I can't remember offhand. I'll give you at the end of the show. Uh, but yeah, apologies if you did listen to last week or two weeks ago. It turned into quite a nice Q&A actually, which we might do Um kind of once every couple of months or something. I think that's quite enjoyable. It was for me anyway. But anyway, welcome to One Chat Live. Um, we've got a great, I've been chatting to this guy for about 10, 15 minutes beforehand, Jay Fasculia. Um, what a lovely chat, really nice. Well, all the guests I have a lovely chat, but I'm really looking forward to introducing to you, especially as the topic we're going to talk about is one that is um, so hot and that hasn't changed. Well, since Born to Vans come out, people still jump at either end so the topic of minimalist shoes versus traditional is it kind of god against satan is it a battle somewhere being set off like game of thrones or is it a little bit full of myths and misconceptions like a lot of the running stuff we do but anyway so um jay for is waiting in the wings for me to bring up um before i do then just to let you know um i've got so many good guests coming up I thank you for all the feedback and all the people who've watched and by watching and subscribing, it means that we're able to actually get more and more guests in. So if you do want to know who's coming up, just subscribe to the, subscribe to the website, um, www.unchatlive.com. Um, subscribe to that. So I know how I'm doing in terms of interesting people. And I'll give you a full list of the next kind of eight or so guests we're coming up to now in August. And it's a great list. I promise you. So um, that said and done, um, I will give him a three second countdown and bring up Mr. J.F. Escudier. Okay, here we are, J.F. Good morning, Matt. How are you? I'm okay. How are you? Good, thanks. Thanks for having me on the show. It's a bit early in here, but I'm happy to, to be with you guys. I know. I apologize for that already. What time is it now where you are? Uh, it's 5.30 now. I guess we uh, we started chatting at 5 a.m. <laughs> I'm so sorry. And, and, I, and I apologize as well for me just starting to get into your mind straight away. And then eventually kind of you're like, I think I might go and get a shower now. It's like, <laughs> yes. <sorry, mate. laughs> but anyway, thank you so much for joining us. Um, I've followed you for a long time, you and Blaze and the running clinic. I'm sure a lot of other people have as well. Um, if you're a therapist and you don't follow J.F. Escoulier or Blaise Dubois um, or The Running Clinic, then you should be. Um, it's a great way of, well, for me, it's been keeping in touch with the true world of minimalist uh, footwear um, because it's not as polarized as a lot of the companies out there make. And um, that's what you are for me, you're a massive um research fan as well as clinical practice you're my go-to guy to see what's happening in terms of um just tipping over towards minimalist side but not going all the way like some other therapists do so thanks so much for joining us my pleasure thanks for having me um where should we start let's start with um, yeah your running history let us know a little bit about how you got into running mm -hmm. you do run don't you <laughs> yeah, I do. <laughs> Otherwise, you often yeah. <laughs> I do. Um, so, what's funny is I've been uh, I've been a football player all my life, football, soccer, um, and uh, all the way till when I finished uh, my physio school about ten years ago now, and uh, and then I started working at the clinic, and I wasn't able to sign up for for football anymore uh, because I was working evenings and weekends. And so I decided to uh, start running. And uh, that's how I started running, just being a physio and, and not being able to play football anymore in a league based on my schedule. So it's been 10 years now uh, that I'm, I'm a runner. Uh, but I'd like to say I'm a recreational runner. So I don't, uh, I don't run for performance. I run for fun. I run because I, I like how it fits in my schedule. Uh, so if you ask me, what's your personal best time on 10K? I'm not even able to to tell you. I can say ballpark. It's you know I think I'm about 40, 40 41 minutes. I'm not a fast runner. Uh, I I do 10 Ks. I I like half marathons. Um, I've done one marathon and uh, it was painful. And uh, I mean I still enjoyed it. Uh, I'll I'll do more at some point, but just not now. It's always funny. I think I think I've broken many a. Uh 
an image that people have of us. They always think we're going to be, or some of us are really fast runners. I mean, like Derek Griffin the other day putting his, I think he did, I can't remember in London, I think it's 231 or something or something crazy. And But for a lot of us therapists involved in runners, it doesn't actually mean that we're like fantastic fast runners. Yeah. So it's bold of you to, well, actually 41 minutes for 10K. It's like, I'd be, if I could still do that, I'd probably shout about it as well. I don't even think I could do that these days. <laughs> um, so I, I'm just a regular runner and, and you won't see my personal best on my Twitter handle because I just don't know what it yeah. is. And, do you get like it's, constant it's messages of people wanting to follow you on Strava and people wanting to follow you on all these kind of yeah they do some people want to follow me on on that but I, i'm not on it so uh <laughs> try to find me if you want but i'm, I'm not on it uh, i'm the same i mean really guys you do not want to watch my strava time <laughs> or not inspire you at all hopefully what comes out my mouth will be more inspiring my time do you have i can't remember do you have children at all no i don't i don't uh, right. uh no kids uh busy schedule with uh, with everything else so i'm um, i'm happy now i can focus on something else but that'll come at some point fantastic yeah no i can always that i only say because i can play the kid card now you know i generally i go out with a double buggy and and yeah people feel sorry for me but um but yeah it's fun anyway so um okay so let's start with i mean i'm glad the topic of today's discussion caused a little bit of controversy um because i put it up there on per on purpose um with the idea of um how did i uh, put it out that it was all novice runners should consider minimalistic shoes <laughs> and it was interesting when we were talking before who you were with um was it chris napier or no? who yeah yeah it was chris, yeah, yeah. chris uh, over the past few days yep and and what was his reaction when he saw that go out on twitter well he laughed because he said oh yeah all runners eh <laughs> it's the attention to detail all runners is great all runners. people yep. pick up on this but i mean i think i put that up there as a little bit of clickbait to try and get people along um to either disagree with that straight away going oh he said all oh, that's like terrible but it was the word consider kind of balanced it i think why don't you you know we should consider everything pretty much um but what um let's go into why why would you make that statement what is it about minimalist yeah. shoes that makes you think all novice runners should consider them well yeah i mean that's a great question and and I think it's important to differentiate between the novice runner and the experienced runner too. But let's just start with the, the novice runner. Um, what is interesting is that you are starting a running program. You're going into pretty much any running store around the world and you say, I'm starting to run. What do you recommend? And what are the chances that a retailer suggests minimal issues? it's it's very close to zero percent right it's it's not happening and um i feel like it's um it's not appropriate to say novice runners shouldn't which is the current state of the market right now uh, because they need protection you need protection when you're starting a running program instead of making you you know run with maybe giving you advice at the same time but making you run softer with less impact and having you increase your cadence because if your shoes are lighter, you will increase your cadence most likely. Uh, and, uh, and why not have that in, in novice runners and also make your feet stronger with uh, shoes that have less cushioning. I just feel like they should at least consider it. And it doesn't mean, again, for everyone who's gonna listen to this, it doesn't mean that they have to wear vibrant five fingers, right? Uh, you can have minimal shoes that are uh, on the index, the minimalist index that maybe some uh, some people know about, uh, you can have a shoot at seventy percent, which still has a bit of cushioning, still has you know a bit of rigidity and and a bit of a drop, but uh, it's not a huge cushion shoe. So that's what I mean by they all should consider them uh, minimalist shoes, the novice runners, but it doesn't mean they have to go you know barefoot necessarily. It's a question of personal preference but they should at least be offered to try them on and see how they feel and then decide for themselves, do I want more cushioning or do I want less cushioning? So that was interesting. You mentioned the minimalist index, um, which is something you were involved in, wasn't it? Yep, exactly. It was part of my PhD. We, uh, we designed that index. We basically created it with a, a group of 42 experts from around the world and, uh, and then we validated it. Yep. And so, yeah, tell us a little bit about that for, for therapists and runners who are not aware of what that, mm -hmm. how that, how that's made up. 
Yeah, it's a scale uh, that basically gives you a percentage of minimalism. Um, and the score doesn't tell you if it's a good shoe or a bad shoe. It just tells you if the shoe is minimalist or not. Uh, and the scale run, runs from 0% minimalist to 100% minimalist. Um, and at the top, again, not a quality scale, but just the top of the index, you have, for example, the Vibram Five Fingers that rate 100%. And at the very uh, bottom, so the 0%, you have the more cushion technologic shoes. And there are five criteria, five subscales in that minimalist index. So first, the weight of the shoe. So the, the lighter the shoe, the higher the score. So the more minimal the shoe will be. Um, and then you have the stack height or the, the, the amount of cushioning under the heel. Uh, again, the lower the stack height, the higher the score. Then you have the heel to toe drop which is the difference between the heel height and the forefoot height. Um, again, the lower, the higher the score. And then we have the technologies in the shoe. So less technologies, higher score, and the flexibility of the shoe. Um, so more flexibility, higher score. And this isn't something that's going out. Is there any brands using this? Is this appearing in any boxes anywhere? Or how do <laughs> runners, is it being used? Not yet, in your dreams. Uh, in my dreams, probably. Um, <laughs> that's a very interesting question. So when it came out, when we published that index, uh, we reached out to all the different companies, regardless of, of bias or anything. So all of them, they were informed either on social media, by direct message or anything. And uh, we had zero zero responses we we're suggesting you should probably put that on the box at least so that runners are aware of it because it can be really helpful in telling you should i take more time or less time to transition from one shoe to another what's your risk of injury and we don't know the answer to that there's no research on it at least not yet but clinically i use it all the time and i tell runners you know you go from let's say you go from a 40 percent shoe to a 60 percent shoe well you need you know you need a couple of months of transition but if you go from a 10 percent and you want to try a 70 percent then you need way more time so it's just an, an educational tool for runners to give them an idea of you know should i take more or less time to transition uh, but the companies probably felt like it was um, an index that would that would be associated with quality and um, and most of their shoes would rate you know 30 percent and less so is it a good a good marketing argument to put on the box oh this shoe rates 20 percent on the minimalist index probably not uh, and my perception is that you know it's probably why uh, most companies didn't want to to use it. That's funny, isn't it? And yet, yeah. But if you're looking at like the first thing that came to my head when you mentioned that the problem of having a twenty percent, if you're looking at like chili strength, you don't automatically go out and buy a five chili strength if that's the hottest chili. You don't think I've got to have five chili strength. You think maybe that's not right for me now. I like kind of a ten percent suits me or twenty percent suits my stomach. So there shouldn't be that. And the other thing, I was wonder how many of these companies were selling shoes with like anti-pronation or over supination shoes or and using terms which we kind of like know now are non-evidence-based mm -hmm. you know, it's um it's weird that reluctance and i like the way you're making it quite clear you're not saying that just because you've got a hundred percent is it's the best shoe for you you just the transition is a good argument in itself because i mean i know something i think i've heard you speak out before is the only evidence or even then it's not water type but the only kind of recommendations we hear these days in contrast to the whole pronation paradigm is comfort um, but it's a very kind of subjective thing isn't it but the qualities you're talking about to do with the stack height um, and so on you could use that as a measure of comfort couldn't you as well if one shoe's not feeling quite comfortable let's move to a different percentage up or down yeah absolutely you can use that as a as a um, kind of a surrogate for uh, for comfort in in some people and and again, as a clinician, that's something that I use quite a bit. And uh, I'm not associated with any brand or I don't receive any money from any brand uh, on purpose. Um, but what I let's say I see a patient in the clinic and they have, you know, a certain condition and I prescribe them a shoe. I'll send them to specific stores who I know are specialized uh, in, in running and um, 
and I'll write on the prescription, go get a shoe with a minimalist index of, for example, 50 to 60%. And I don't write any brand, I don't write anything else. And I just basically give them a prescription on uh, a broad range of shoes and they go to the store and then they try on five or six different pairs that fit with that and then they choose based on their comfort. Um, but that's, that's how I use it clinically. It sounds really good. And as far as I'm aware, there's nothing else similar around, is there? Uh, no, there's nothing else. Wow. Mm -hmm. How are we going to get it out there? So even even <laughs> shoes that, even independence, no, it's, it's the brands, isn't it? So even brands that lean towards trying to kind of reach out with their minimalist shoes, they just still weren't interested without naming any names. There's just uh, no... we, we just never heard back from anyone. And uh, could we have you know, try it a bit harder, maybe. Um, mm. But in the end, we just never heard from anyone. So we decided to uh, at least use it ourselves at the running clinic. And uh, if you go on the, the running clinics website, there's a whole section about shoes. And we have uh, now we have hundreds and even thousands of different models that are rated. Uh, right. So we have people rating the shoes and they, uh, they, they put them up on their website. Uh, so you have you have that resource available for people who are interested in knowing oh, what's what's my shoe score and you can even calculate it yourself if you just input the values of weight stack height uh drop that you can find on any manufacturer's website and you just have the shoes in your hand and you identify which technologies are are on the shoe and what's the flexibility like you just click on calculate and it gives you the uh, the index that's great. So that's on. You can see people who are watching the podcast can't see the screen, but that was a question from Timothy Grigg on the screen. If you're watching the video, mm -hmm. um, so they go to runningclinic.com. The running yep. clinic. The running clinic .com, the run. and there's a section called shoes and minimalist index, and that's where you can get that information. Okay, there you go, Timothy. So yeah, hopefully, um, I suppose it is a way. This is why I do these podcasts as well because I, the future probably is clinicians being a bit wiser and having more tools to help runners who go and see them and um, that's it yeah, it's gonna be a very slow process changing what appears in runners world and all the magazines and the brands and stuff um but yeah if clinicians can actually start saying oh go and check out the running clinic uh, com and their shoe index and that's a start isn't it so hopefully that will help you timothy you can be there you go you can start getting the ball rolling um so with regards to let's talk about reducing risk of injury okay i've kind of harped on and i've often have guests on who are very quick to kind of point out that with an evidence pyramid in terms of the evidence then footwear kind of sits towards the top and the little top in the sense that there's not a lot of evidence to support that it should be a top priority to reduce injury um would you say that's fair enough that there's plenty of other things we should be concentrating about before worrying about shoes or do you think it should be more paramount and appear more towards the bottom? No, I, I actually absolutely agree. I think the bottom of the, of the pyramid is, is load management. There's no question about it. And, and shoes are a part of the puzzle. They're not, they're not the one thing you need to focus on. Uh, you know, in the end, if a runner comes in and asks me, what's your best advice for preventing injuries? I'll just say, listen to your body and, and just be gradual in any change that you make in your program, regardless of the shoe you're wearing. So I totally agree with you on that. Um, I just think that it's neglected very often in terms of, you know, how it can influence the loads that you're putting onto different structures. And that's why it, I consider it way more in terms of treatment than in terms of prevention overall. So you think maybe as well as monitoring how often you're going out, how long you're spending out, how many times a week you're going out, you think the type of shoes in your feet could also be part of that load management? Yeah, absolutely. Because it's it's basically shifting the loads from, uh, from certain joints to other ones. Um, for example, we know that if you're wearing more cushioning, then you'll have more loads in, in your knees and less in your feet. But if you're wearing more minimal shoes, then you will have uh, more load on your feet and Achilles uh, tendons, but less on your knees. Uh, so it's just about redistributing the loads and uh, not so much, you know, the, the overall load will depend on your on your training uh, schedule for sure.
And so what you've just said is like a very fair statement that, you know, you can change where the load goes to tissue wise. And that's been supported pretty well by the research. Do you think then, therefore, that some people are kind of physiologically just born with more ability to take load on the, for example, the calf complex and Achilles, and they're going to be more naturally more beneficial from wearing a minimalist trainer, whereas for some people were better off dealing with the load on their knees and were better off in a cushion trainer or is it something that we should try and change or just see what sort of person's in front of us mm -hmm. yeah i mean you're making a great point there i think obviously genetics is is a big factor in what where you'll be injured uh, in the end uh, because most runners will get injured um but I think that, and that's why your title was as catchy as all novice runners should consider minimalist shoes. Because I just feel like the probability of a novice runner who's starting with more minimalist shoes, and we're talking about 70% on the scale here, not like not a hundred percent. But it seems that if you're wearing this kind of shoes, you may increase the chance of running with less impact. And it's not everyone will do it. I know all people listening, they're like, oh, no, it's not happening for everyone. Uh, and after six months, uh, there's a study that says it doesn't it doesn't stay. It's OK. I'm fine with that. But most people will still do it and will have an increased cadence uh, and will also get stronger feet. So I just feel like it's something they should consider for preventing in the end and also making your feet stronger and adapting them to the loads of running. If you protect them forever, then obviously if you switch to a minimal issue one day, you'll, you'll be injured. But what if, you know, all the kids out there and all the novice runners out there would start a running program with shoes that make their feet stronger? I think that that'd be fair to say that there would be way less transition injuries when all of a sudden that, 30 40 year old they they start going to more minimal shoes yeah it makes sense on paper i mean i think the question is how how's the reach research in terms of um wearing a more minimalist shoe will actually make your feet stronger in an advantageous way to running well the, the advantageous way to running that we're not sure about um, but the fact that shoes more minimalist shoes will make your feet stronger there is quite a few studies on that uh, I, I wrote a blog post um, I guess a couple of years ago now uh, on the running clinics uh, blog and uh, I, I was mentioning the different studies that came out so you have a study by Brueggemann that started the whole thing and then you have uh, studies by Chen for example and the one by Chen was probably the most interesting one um, where they, they took people for six months and they asked them to start running with Vibram five fingers or just go with more cushion shoes. And, and they looked at uh, MRI of the intrinsic muscles of the foot. So the small muscles in your feet that, uh, that help you uh, basically control the impact and absorb loads. And uh, also the extrinsic muscles, so more at the calf level. And what they noticed was an increase in the... Um, in the group group uh, who were wearing minimal shoes, they had an increase in strength and, and also volume of these muscles. So they do get stronger, they do get bigger. Uh, would that reflect into injury prevention? We have no idea. Would that reflect into improved performance? We have no idea, but what we know is that if you get stronger, typically you perform better. And that's pretty good evidence out there in runners that you know if you strengthen, you just go out and do strength training for a couple of times a week. Uh, there was a good review on that by Rich Blagrove uh, that came up, came out uh, a year ago or so. Of course, you'll perform better. So why not just get your feet stronger? Yeah, it's interesting as well, because we were talking in a past episode about actually i think it was when i was when derek um, griffin left me at the altar the other day talking about how strength training um how it's very context-based if you're running then and you're getting strength gains which are true to running whereas if you're doing kind of like clams and leg abductions and kind of even squats it doesn't necessarily make you stronger at running you might be able to do a squat better so i guess that's quite a strong aunt as well you know you're actually getting stronger whilst you're running so it's going to serve you know, in theory 100 percent so yeah, it kind of makes sense. Just um, to track back a little bit, you said like 70%. I'm interested 
to to know more about and start using this minimalist index as well myself traditionally and maybe a little bit more limited i've kind of used the drop um the difference between the heel height and the toe um, as an indicator um is that the main is that the biggest factor which kind of shifts you up and down the 70 to 80 or down to 60 or is there something else that should be considered yeah uh it's interesting that you mentioned the drop because the drop is the best marketing argument out there right now and you go to any shoe store they'll talk about the drop mm. if you look at the research about the drop there's not much out there and it, it seems like it's not influencing a whole lot uh the running by mechanics at all um, so drop itself if you isolate it doesn't have that much influence you have to consider cushioning way more than drop. Uh, you have to consider the flexibility of the shoe and the weight of the shoe. So I, you know, the drop, again, I see a bunch of runners at the clinic and they say, oh, I'm wearing a four mil drop or I'm wearing a, an eight mil drop. But the reality is that you can have a four mil drop shoe that's a Hoka or you can have, have one that's, that's also way more minimal shoe. So it's only one factor. And that's why I think using the index allows you to basically consider all these different factors and then you're more likely to have a, a better idea of, of the influence of those shoes on your running mechanics and uh, and on the loads that you're applying at different places so it's it's a combination of drop yes but also stack height weight technology sorry technologies and flexibility yeah i think that'll I don't know. I, I imagine a lot of therapists, runners will believe anything the therapist tells them or the coach tells them, but hand on heart telling somebody, oh yeah, I think you should reduce your kind of like drop by two millimeters. How much of a difference is that really going to make? <laughs> you know, and also the size of that person's foot, whether it's a woman's shoe or men's shoe, that would change yeah. the whole drop thing as well by a few millimeters. So it's kind of Absolutely. something we've told runners, but deep inside we're going, really, am I saying that? <laughs> so it sounds like, yeah the, the minimalist index you guys created is going to be yeah far more useful in that um so yeah something we should all jump on so um cool let's move on to do, 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 do. form before footwear <laughs> so <laughs> he sniggers for those of you who can't see or hear him um i let's have a thing back to 2000 well 2011 was probably the first reference to form before footwear and it was something that a lot of people at the time um kind of jumped on and for probably good reason because it was kind of pointing out that rather than well what we've kind of said today rather than worrying straight away about what you're putting on your feet you need to think about running as a skill how are you running um let's have a look back let me bring some pictures up because it's interesting to see the names and stuff that appeared just going to bring up for those of you watching the podcast you won't see this or listen to the podcast but we're just gonna have a little look at um some of the stuff that appeared um what we got on here oh that's you running actually oh yeah oh there we go <laughs> yeah I, I asked you earlier on but i couldn't work out i spent about 25 minutes that i won't get back in my life trying to work out what shoes they were yeah you um, should have been zooming in on the right side there you could see I was oh, looking at I the logo yeah i couldn't work it out yeah what index are they uh they're pretty much around the 85 percent mark wow you must be a great runner then not necessarily <laughs> I'm, just, uh, I'm just a happy oh runner <laughs> i've just fallen fit myself it's not a measure of how good a runner you are it's what works for your body yeah, yeah. um so yeah there he, he actually says what he believes in people um let's go to 2000 uh, let's have a look i think the first reference i found was james of kinetic rev um who at the time was putting out some pretty great information new information and that was his catch line form before footwear um a lot of it's changed a little bit since then but at the time it was very relative and very popular um, and there's a lot of love out there for james um christian barton who i know you know very well um this was in 2013 i'm going to read it out for people just listening to the podcast he was replying to ian griffiths who was a guest on our um on run chat live a while ago um, and Chris says the greatest thing that will come out of barefoot phenomenon will be that everyone finally learns the importance of form before footwear. Um, so I, I couldn't quite work out. Was that kind of a bit of a jive, a bit of a kind of a attack of born to run that what we're really realizing is because people are injuring themselves that it's not a case of what's on your foot. It's how you're running. Would you see that as a bit of a, 
I, I don't know. Uh, that's a good question. I think uh, at that point, Christian was just outlining that some runners, regardless of what they're wearing, what they have on their feet uh, may or may not change the way they run, uh, which is which is true. That's the case. Uh, but again, depending on the index, and that's why we created the index in the first place is because, you know, uh, you can it can give you an idea of what kind of shoes are more likely to change your biomechanics and saying that they don't change biomechanics is false. They do mm. in most people, not in everyone, but in most people. Um, but it depends on how you define minimal issues, right? And yeah, definitely. That's why point. we have that index. And there's a great study by uh, Robert, Roberto Squadrone in, in Italy on that, where they took um, eight different models of shoes well, actually seven and barefoot. And they looked at how each one of these shoes would change how people run. And uh, it's funny because we actually took the minimalist index of these shoes and we calculated it. And you can see, you can see what's the relationship in that cohort, at least, uh, between what shoes you're wearing and gradually moving towards uh, more running like barefoot, basically. Um, so depending on the index and that's seen the 70% seems to be a tipping point where maybe most of these people, at least, and people I see in the clinic, uh, 70% seems to be the one where maybe that's where you get some effects, uh, better chances of changing the way you run, not in everyone, but, uh, certainly in, in a lot of people. Yeah. Oh, very interesting. Yeah. It's, we'll talk about it in a bit after a moment, if I don't go back to it about how much of a difference there is between being totally barefoot and then wearing something mm -hmm. actually on your feet. Um, Cause I think that kind of the research shows there is quite a big difference in terms of the results. Um, so remind me if I don't remember that in a sec. Um, we had, um, that was, I wasn't one chat live at the time, but it's updated it. So I went in there and said, what did I say? Um, I hasten to add rotating shoes is a great and possibly helps reduce injury, but at the end of the day it's formed before footwear. So I was kind of swinging that flag um, from the balcony as well. Um, Craig Payne stepped in September 2013. Obviously, Craig um, is very big on the research. Sometimes I feel sits at the other end of the table with Blaze at one end and Craig at the other, but both wonderful people, um, I can assure everyone. Um, so he was looking at studies which kind of showed in three months vertical loading rates went up in minimalist shoes. Um, do you remember that particular study he was talking about? or? Uh, I'm not sure exactly which one he was talking about at the time. Oh, he'll find it if there's a study out there, which is gonna. <laughs> That's the thing, isn't it? It does look like sometimes there's people out there who are just looking. He, he, for those of you who don't follow Craig, again, he's kind of sits at the other end for, for me from Blaze, rightfully or wrongfully. So, he's somebody who I watched from the early days, and it was just if there's research which was being analysed incorrectly, um, he tried to be fair. If he found anybody cherry, cherry picking, um, then he would kind of call them out. But he definitely seems to sit on the, as he refers to, he doesn't like the fanboys. I never know who he's referring to as a fanboy. Is Blaze one of his fanboys? I can't remember. That's a good question. I'm not sure either. Is Blaze a fanboy? They just remain this. Anyway, people are just blindly running into barefoot running, thinking it's the greatest thing in the world um, and avoiding the evidence. Yeah, you know, what's funny about that is even in, in 2013, where I guess it was the, the, the big hype, on minimal issues it never went higher than 10 percent of all market shares mm. and and people made a, a huge case of you know saying minimal issues are bad or they're not necessarily better but no one's ever talked about oh well it's still 90 percent of shoes out there that are traditional maximalist shoes and i think you know we need to educate people on well the mass people on you know shoes in general and not just pick on one specific type of shoes and and just basically uh try to to bash on it so never been more than 10 percent. yeah it's interesting but how much of that do you think is down if we had an elite runner if someone won a significant world championship race or something wearing vibrams or barefoot then it would kind of poke the other way but it doesn't really happen yet so why doesn't that happen by the way why don't we have collect, um, cases of elite athletes proudly wearing something which is like 90%? Or does it happen and we don't hear about it? I don't know. 
Yeah. Uh, I mean, that's a great question. It all comes down to personal preference in the end. You, you see a lot of elite athletes who compete with with some types of shoes and, and if they like them, then good for them. Uh, I think there's a huge influence of, of sponsors too in, in that. Um, I mean, a lot of these elite runners, they train with more minimalist shoes when they are younger and then uh, they reach a certain point where they get a sponsor and then they change their shoes and they just adapt to what the market is saying. Um, so I think I think we need to be careful with that. Would they be performing better if they had more minimalist shoes? I'm not saying that at all. I, I don't know what the answer is. Um, I think I just think that uh, marketing and uh, and sponsors have a big role in that. And you have evidence to back this up, or, or is it just a conspiracy theory? It's a conspiracy theory, <laughs> absolutely. <laughs> From talking with a lot of uh, of people who uh, who have done it, I guess, who have been training in uh, you know in bare feet or very minimal issues, and and really liked it. And you know, I was involved in in a program when I used to live back east, eastern Canada in, in Quebec City. Uh, it's a program uh, for uh, immigrants, a running program, and they, they were coming in the country and they were in school and they, uh, it's not specifically for immigrants, but a lot of them were, and they were um, basically in school and try to keep them in school. And they started that running program with them. And uh, a lot of them, they came in and they said, you know, I prefer wearing with way less cushioning because it's always what I've been running in. And, uh, and now I come here and I have a hard time finding shoes that fit me or they would come in with, you know, these fitting injuries and they prefer just being in more minimal shoes. So again, it's based on experience and uh, I don't have any evidence to back this up, but I just find it interesting um, to see the whole influence of, of marketing and sponsors. Yeah, it's definitely a factor. I suppose the 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 response you got from the whole minimalist index thing from these same brands is kind of testing me to that really, of not wanting to yeah um, interrupt the cash cow sort of thing. Yeah, it's a shame. But hey, that's what makes the world go around. I suppose. Um, I suppose the way we can change it is just educating runners, and then runners going to shop and going whoa 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 because that's already happening. I think with gait analysis, hopefully, I like to think I've played a small part in that. The same as Ian Griffiths and other people who have been kind of defeating this pronation paradigm thing. I mean, I know that I've I've not so much now because I'm surrounded by a few more independent running stores. But at one point, I was probably one of the most hated men in my hometown was far as the running shops because I was encouraging runners to you know say, well, hold on, what do you what why what do you mean I need a um, overpronation shoe? Have you not seen Haley Gabriel Selassie? Have you not seen the YouTube video? I was even giving people links. You know, when phones came in, it was great. Look, watch this and then tell me I still need an overpronation shoe. But I suppose we need the same thing to happen for runners when they go in and they're told, oh, yeah, you're a big guy. You need a Brooks Ghost or something. You need something big cushioning. We need them to actually question the store. Um, or at least yeah. question the staff on the shop floor who will then feel embarrassed and go to the boss and say, oh, my God, that was really traumatic. Yeah. They told me that <laughs> just because they're big, they're doing loads of cushioning. Apparently, there's this Jay Fasculia guy with an index site. And I don't know what they're talking about. But that's yeah, probably I mean, the way it, to change it, isn't it? Yeah, in the end, it's all about educating people. About I think the main point is really adaptation. And you look at all these studies on running injuries and looking at different shoes, and they say, you know, going to more minimalist shoes will will create more injuries. And in the end, they're not studies looking at injury rates based on the shoe. They're looking at injury rates based on do you change your shoes or you don't change your shoes. And most of these studies are, are basically reporting transition injuries. So again, that's why uh, coming back to your title for this, uh, for the ad for this podcast, all runners should consider a minimal issue. Novice runners should consider a minimal issue. Because I think if you start with them right off the bat, you won't have that issue of having to adapt to different technologies or to adapt to uh, different drops or different densities, different motion control features or whatever, because you will be adapted to being closer to the ground. And I think you know you can make yourself a bit stronger and more resilient if you do that. There's no study right now looking at people who are actually uh, habituated and adapted to barefoot running or running in more minimal issues and then transitioning to maximal issues. 
But I would be curious to see that. And then maybe the conclusions would be, oh, maximal issues can injure people. Well, again, it's the same thing. It's adaptation. It's just transition injuries. And that's why we need to educate runners on adaptation and just be careful with any change. That's why the, the minimalist index, I think, is, is a good tool for that because it gives them uh, something to, to try and rely on to tell them, should I transition? You know, should I take one month or should I take six months to transition? And why do you want to transition? Yeah, no, it's all very, very sensible advice. And it's a shame that your voice isn't heard more than what we do. Because I think often it's the, what's the same all over life? It's the fanatics who kind of ruin the cause, isn't it? Because we're used to, you know, people claiming that this idea that you need to run barefoot because it improves proprioceptive or proprioception of the foot. I think that's been overplayed a lot. And even using the word proprioception doesn't really make sense. Um, I suppose there is neurofeedback and sensory feedback to the brain which lets you adjust your stride and everything and that's important um but it rather than just saying it could help it's kind of you know we see these great memes and pictures and people natural fallacies you know with all as close as you are to nature that the better things are going to be which we know is a typical fallacy because you know tsunamis and earthquakes are very natural but they're not really very good for us so it's kind of a it's the same sort of thing isn't it can't claim that just because we were born without shoes and we're better running without shoes so it's people like yourself yeah who need to present these arguments differently and just use the it's the, the jigsaw words that you should try it you should consider it why not blah 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 uh, but yeah it doesn't really sell very well it's hard to make a living out of just suggesting things to people and saying if that doesn't work we'll try something else it's just not a mm -hmm. it's not a strong marketing tool is it but it's Absolutely. the way we should go with runners isn't it that's the thing yeah, absolutely. Um, and yeah, I mean, just to go back on the whole minimalist maximalist in the end, I mean, there have been five or six studies now over the past couple of years that, that came out showing that if you run with uh, hokas, not to pick on them, but that's the kind of shoes that they tested in all of these studies. So very maximalist uh, shoes. If you run with those, you increase ground the ground reaction force and even knee loading. But these studies, they tend to go under the radar because, you know, cushioning, how, how would it really increase impact? And, and uh, maybe those, those fanboys, as, as Craig is referring to, are, are bringing those studies up. But I think, I think everyone should know about that because the, the misconception is that cushioning reduces impact. We're actually uh, conducting a study on that right now. And for those listening who haven't uh, done it yet, it's uh, it's an online survey. Uh, and if you if they just look at, they look up my Twitter profile, it's my pinned tweet right now. It's a survey asking people what they think about footwear and injuries. Is it important or not? Uh, what are the features that are important? Do you prevent injuries if you have more cushioning? That kind of questions. And then we provide them with an educational module, so they have access to the latest evidence on the topic. It's a short module. You can read it in 10 minutes. Uh, and then we ask them questions again after. So did that change your perceptions or not? Um, so I think I think we'll have more data on what people think. We don't have a lot right now, um, but we need more of that. So that's on your Twitter handle, is it there? There's a link there. Um, Correct. Yeah, it's, the, my, uh, it's my uh, pinned, pinned uh, tweet right now. OK. And that's just at JF Escudia, isn't it? Correct. Yep. Uh, JF SQD. Okay. Cool. We'll stick that on here just so people can. Yeah. People love a survey, don't they? That's another thing. People love polls and surveys and fill this out. Makes everyone feel important. But that's good. No, it's what we need, really. Information. Yeah. Like we're already at, uh, we're over 1,500 uh, people who responded to it already. So I think we'll, we're going to be able to give meaningful data. And, uh, and the goal is to educate. So that's why we provide the educational module, too. Brilliant. Wonderful okay then um where are we 216 let's talk a little bit about and i'll look at my crib sheet now because we've gone backwards and forwards to what i wanted to talk about um 6 16 a.m not 2 16 Matt, so. <laughs> yes sorry <laughs> thanks for rubbing it in uh yeah i'm sorry about that so i'm still interested to i've always fantasized about having um, a shoe shop working in a shoe shop selling shoes i'd love the idea of it but I believe that my business would collapse after a week because I don't think it would work. It's, you know, imagine if someone, 
especially if you're using the comfort paradigm. I mean, imagine if you go into one shop and and you say, what sort of shoes do I need? And you go, mm, try these on, are they comfy? Yeah, well, they're the ones for you then. And then you go down the road and they've got this great analysis with kind of like digital readouts and force measurements and they work out this is the perfect shoe for you. You're going to spend money on the second shop, aren't you? How you don't have a shoe shop, do you? I don't. No, 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 no bias. I don't get any money <sighs> from any uh, any shoe uh, related features or companies. But if, if you did have one and you, uh, regardless of the actual um, kind of success money marketing kind of part of it, but a runner going to a shoe shop for you, what would be the best service they could? Let's say it's a novice runner. Let's keep it in that um, kind of a uh, uh, runner mm -hmm. what would be the best questions or or um, analysis that could be done in the shoe shop by the staff and so that they go out with a with a suitable shoe for them if it's possible yeah. what would you say yeah i think that would be all the education that comes around the shoe more than you know giving them one specific shoe and uh, i i like to take um, as an example there's a, a store here a local store in vancouver uh called distance runwear just to Put them out there uh, but they um when they sell a shoe they tell you other stuff around it so be gradual it's a ch if it's a change they ask you what you're wearing before they give you advice on you know having a higher cadence step rate uh, they tell you to run softer they so they tell you advice uh on top of the uh the actual shoe itself and i think that's that's where the shoe retail uh, should be. The only issue is most retailers don't, they claim they don't have time to do that because obviously you're losing sales if you're chatting with people for half an hour. But that's what we do as clinicians. When I see someone, it's a whole puzzle. So what will prevent injuries is training loads and how gradual you are. So if I'm a retailer today and I see a novice runner coming in, I'll have them try on different models for sure including more minimal shoes. So I'll have them try on, let's say on the index, they would have a couple models of 70%, 80%, and then they can have a 50% and a 30 and a 20 or 10% and see what they prefer, yes. But then on top of that, I'll tell them to start by doing, you know, three minutes of running or four or five minutes of running and gradually build up. Because the reason why they'll get injured is not the shoe, is load management. So I think I think there needs to be more of that, um, and uh, that would help prevent injuries more than the actual shoe itself. So did you say I might have missed it? I was having a moment somewhere, but did you say introduce them to different shoes using the minimalist index? That's fantastic. Are you putting them on a treadmill to have a little run and see how it feels? You can absolutely. Why not? If you have a treadmill in in your store, uh, I think that's what I would do just to get a sense of how people feel controlled condition uh, you can also have them run outside if you prefer but here in Vancouver it's raining all the time uh, well not now we have nice summers but winter is raining all the time uh, so I think controlling conditions uh, being on a treadmill would be a good idea and not looking at picky stuff you know looking at pronation and things like that but more uh, get a, a feel of that comfort yes but um, getting them also to run you know to decrease the impact when they run and to increase their their step rate as well so you can kind of get how objective much, data. how much can a novice runner it's tricky isn't it with that comfort thing because mm -hmm. maybe if someone who hasn't really run much before maybe they're going to get benefit from actually what they regard as uncomfortable might be the actual what they should be feeling because you need that certain hardness that to, to get that stretch recall and elastic recall. So maybe they're looking to run on clouds and they think, oh, this is much more comfy. So it's very tricky. Sometimes I worry about how to actually, how beneficial it is to put someone on a treadmill and say which feels more comfortable. That is maybe where some form of um, feedback in terms of impact loads or something might be useful, I don't know, for that runner. Yeah, I, I think the main point of comfort is uh, to make sure these people to go back home and they're actually going out for a run. So you want to make sure that they like them enough that they will stick to running. Uh, and that's why I think comfort is important. Would comfort really reduce injuries? Not sure. Uh, and it's the whole comfort filter paradigm thing that's, mm. you know, there's no evidence on it. It's a nice theory. It's a nice concept. But in the end, do you, do you reduce injuries if you choose a shoe that's more comfortable subjectively? 
no data. Mm. Uh, I, I just think is a way to keep people active and keep people running is, yeah, of course, I feel great in those shoes and I'll just go out for my run and get the health benefits out of it. And likewise, it's tricky as well because, okay, so they're buying something to run off road. They're buying to, to run across fell or mountains or something and you're selling them, put them on a treadmill. Are they comfortable? Yeah, they're lovely. Okay, right now I'm going to do your run. It's almost as if I know some shoe shops, some uh, which do actually say if you're not comfortable with the shoe within six or three months or something, you can bring it back and we'll exchange it if it's the first shoe you've ever bought from us. But it almost feels like sometimes for someone to get a shoe that's good for them, they need to actually go and test it out for maybe a month or so on the on the running surface of their choice at the speed of their choice and then see if the shoe kind of works then to get a true comfort feedback thing but of course you can't have a model of a shop where people are bringing back shoes in two months saying no i don't like these and they're like covered in crap so it's it's a tricky one isn't it to be able to sell yeah. someone a, a, a good shoe yeah it is i mean i think it's it should be seen as try it for a month or two and then you decide what your next pair will be more than just bring it back and as a as a store i don't think that'd be a good business model no, to say like bring it back in a couple months but yeah I get, I get your point yeah but if that's the other thing i kind of if if shoes weren't priced so ridiculously as they are then just because imagine you buy a pair of shoes and they don't quite work out to be very comfortable at the moment that's the other thing once if you're a novice runner in two months time the sort of shoe that feels comfortable for you is going to change as you get stronger as you're going a further distance as you're running faster so often i'll say to runners you know don't first of all find a decent price shoe that's not going to cripple you because if you do need to put that in the wardrobe for a while that may well be your great shoe in two or three months time you know, even minimalistic, using the minimalist index, you might buy a 70 and realize this doesn't feel right at the moment. Mm -hmm. But hopefully if things go well in two or three months time. You can then transition carefully to that, can't you? So that makes sense. Absolutely. Yeah, it does. It does make sense. But it is tricky while shoe prices can be what they are in some stores. Yeah, sure. yeah, I agree with that. And I, I was just, I'm thinking back about your tweet that you put out there saying, you know, runners should consider having multiple shoes uh to help prevent injuries and and that's something that i get asked a lot too is should i be wearing more than than one shoe to help prevent injuries and based on that one single study that wasn't even testing you know what's the injury rate if you're rotating between shoes it was just looking at different variables in 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 a statistical model people wearing more than one pair of shoes came out as statistically significant. So did, was it tested after to say, oh yeah, if you know, if you have three different pairs of shoes, 3.6, like they were saying in that study, mm. does it prevent injuries? We, we don't know that, but what we know is that variety could probably be a good thing. Um, mm. But in the end, I'm not selling shoes. So what I tell my patient is just buy one pair of shoes, and just vary your surfaces, vary the type of, of stresses you're applying and just go on grass, go on, on gravel a little bit, go on, uh, on the road and, and vary the surfaces because you're varying the stresses, but mm. you don't have to spend a lot of money to do that. It's true. It's a good point. Yeah. Rather than change the shoe, change the surface. And you may well discover that because you are who you are at this moment of time, you need to stick to road or you need to stick to off road. It's finding what works for you, isn't it? The same as Absolutely. finding what shoe works for you. Yeah, I just like the rotating shoes, and I know it won't suit everybody if someone discovers they're better off sticking to the road, but it kind of fits in nicely with this idea of just not exposing the tissue to the same force every single time, getting some variance in there. It kind of makes sense. If you, It's like clicking a mouse. If you keep doing that click every day with the same position, it's going to get tired. It's the same kind of like order of muscle use and stuff. Or it's the same. <sighs> Damn it. <laughs> <laughs> I think I think it's good to have some sort of, of variety for sure. But I yeah. think even if you run, you know, eighty percent of your weekly volume on the road, you'll be adapted to roam mm. better. Uh, but you may have less less capacity to go on the trail and uh, you know and, and feel well adapted to the trail so i i think it depends on what you're doing if you're an ultra runner then obviously you want to vary as much as you can because it's going to vary the whole time during your race but if you're a marathon yeah. runner are you going to train you know 50 percent on the trail with trail shoes no you have to be specific to adapt to your event and you need to adapt to distance running on the straight line because if you don't you'll just get an IT band syndrome when 
you stick to the road and and uh, just add more repetition. Yeah, yeah. And how about? I mean, I've often proposed to people that um, they may well discover that when they're suffering from certain, whether it's injury or pain or both, you might find a shoe that works for you if you're suffering from a bit of knee pain, and you go out and suddenly you put this pair of shoes on. They're your go-to shoes, and you can continue running. Uh, but you're not getting that stimulus causing the pain. Um, some shoes I know that I'll actually I've got some insoles, um, which if I'm getting pain under my medial arch or something, whether it was tibia or posterior tibia or something, I'll put those particular insole in. So I'm able to run. I'm not aware of it too much, and I get through the pain. So mm -hmm. I think maybe different shoes depending on. We might not be sure how. I think it's always interesting. The reason I like Ian Griffiths and also Craig Payne so much is they're very much. They introduced me a lot to the the kinetics instead of the kinematics it might not change the actual way your foot's moving mechanically but it's just redistributing the load and um, which as we know and i think you mentioned before is it's probably how a lot of how shoes work it's not necessarily how your foot moves it's at what where the way the loads are being distributed is that fair absolutely. to say absolutely oh. and like you were mentioning here uh, i mean if you have foot pain what's the best treatment for foot pain if it's you know a, a recent onset of foot pain you want to protect it i'm not going to tell you go buy minimal shoes if you started having foot pain recently um, for the same reason as i'm not going to tell you if you started having knee pain recently go buy shoes with more cushioning right so i i think we can use shoes as a way to redistribute load especially if there's an injury if it's an acute injury typically i will not change you know, uh, if it's an acute knee injury, I'll just manage training loads. I'm not going to tell that person just go buy a minimal shoe. If they had pain for 10 years, then it's different. So I may use the shoes as part of my treatment plan to help them reduce load. Um, but if they have foot pain, uh, you know, it's a recent onset of foot pain. Yeah, sure. Put more cushioning. Uh, protect your foot. It's going to help you for sure. But is it going to help you in the long run? Probably not. You mm -hmm. need to adapt your foot to having a little bit more load, I think, to make it stronger, especially if you're a runner and that's your point of contact with the ground. What's your, what about inserts? Do you use them much or like off the shelf inserts? Do you play around with those in the same shoe mm -hmm. to change the way it's working for you? Uh, I do recommend uh, when people come in with foot pain, I do recommend mostly to go with off the shelf uh, just because the efficacy of off the shelf versus custom has been shown to be uh, the same in, in most studies, uh, a lot of studies coming out of Australia on that. Um, and now in their studies, even they're using, they're using off the shelf and not custom anymore. Uh, but I think, I think I want to be efficient in terms of cost for my patient and getting that effect. I can get it with uh, just off the shelf insoles. Yeah. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. Right, look, JF, it's 2.30 already. Uh, sorry, what time is it? 6.30. 6, 6 6.30, yeah, the sun is up. It's coming up. <laughs> nice time for a run, right? <laughs> um, fantastic. I think, I'm hoping, as far as I can recall, there's some fantastic information there. I'm particularly, what I've personally taken away is, is yeah, use of this uh, minimalist index. I think it's it should be um, used increasingly more. Um, by therapists in clinics all the information they need they can get off um, the uh, runningclinic.com website um, if we can get our runners used to seeing this and using it then maybe we can influence brands to start thinking oh runners are expecting to see this because the brands will just give the runners what they demand isn't it supply and demand that's the way they make the money so i'm hoping that's something which will come across from this interview the other thing i've got from you is which I'm hoping will get out to therapists and runners is, is it's not polarized at all. You know, you haven't sat there and said, right, everyone should be wearing minimalist trainers. Everybody's no. got to do this. And, and, and I think that's a great point, man. I think, you know, you, you ask all these experts that you mentioned during this one hour and uh, I know most of them and all of them would agree that the main point to reduce running injuries is load management. I think mm. everyone agrees on that. It's just, you know, after that, let's say 80% for me to be 80% load management after that 80%, then we disagree on, you know, the other 20%, but mm -hmm. I think everyone agrees. And I'm sure you do as well, that training load management is, is the key point, And that's what runners need to, uh, to remember is just how much and how you do it more than what you have in your feet. 
Definitely. And that's the that's the message which hopefully runners will hear and therapists as well, because therapists are just as guilty of getting bogged down on the other 20 percent before checking, you know, um, or even asking the runner about their, you know, not just what they've done this week, but what they've done the two months or this year or just checking, looking over a long, longer period of time. Fantastic. What have you let's uh, what have you got coming up, JF? I know you're a very busy man. What have you got coming yeah. up in the next few months? quite busy right now um i'm uh currently looking at all the abstracts that we received for uh for an upcoming conference so we're uh, we're hosting the third world congress of sports uh, physical therapy here in vancouver uh in october 2019 so it's, it's october 4th and 5th um and that's a lot of work for us and uh chris napier has been he's chairing the organizing committee on that and I'm chairing the scientific committee and uh, we have a pretty good lineup, I would say, uh, just to plug it in there for those uh, healthcare professionals <laughs> listening to, to this podcast. But uh, we're working hard on a conference. If uh, people are interested in, in coming, uh, just have a look at spc2019.ca. Uh, that's our website. Then you have the full program there. Um, so we're currently reviewing the, the abstracts for the conference. Fantastic, yeah. Um, and what days did you say that was again? It's October 4th and 5th. And uh, we have pre-conference courses on the 3rd as well. Um, it's coming up soon, but uh, there's still room to to sign up, obviously. It's going to be a great conference. I think okay. if you look at the program, you'll see spc2019.ca is the, the website. We'll make sure we stick that website um, in the notes and in the comments on Facebook. Brilliant. Okay, well... Um, so, yeah, thank you very much. I'm sorry I got you up so early in the morning. But being right, I'm, the, I'm ready to start my day now. <laughs> being the altruistic person you are and your passion for helping runners, it was worth it, I hope, for you. It was, definitely. Yeah. Um, wonderful. Um, you are, where are you mainly on social media? Would you say people connect with you more on Facebook or Instagram or it's more Twitter. Day? It's more Twitter because Twitter? Yeah. I, I like to keep it brief. Uh, yeah. And uh, Facebook for me is just too long. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah, that's why I stick to, I tend to stick with Twitter. So at JFSQD on, on Twitter. Okay, so people, there you heard it. Um, that's uh, get back. On. I've, I've started going a bit more to Twitter for the same reason, actually. I find Facebook, I just disappear for hours. Twitter's a nice, short, kind of like mm -hmm. bullet point kind of version. So I've started using Twitter a bit more again now. Um, so yeah, okay, JF, thank you very much. I appreciate your time. Thanks for having me on the show, Matt. Uh, pleasure chatting with you. Brilliant. We'll talk again soon. What I'm going to do is I'm going to make you disappear and then I'm going to say goodbye to everyone and then I'll come back and thank you. Sounds second. good. All, All right. right. I'll speak Bye, everyone. Thank you. Thanks. There you go. Didn't I tell you he was a lovely bloke? Fantastic. Um, yeah, some wonderful information out there, hopefully for therapists and runners, which is always kind of our goal on Run Chat Live. Um, we try and steer it so that the information given will help both um, because um, – Sometimes therapists are guilty of overcomplicating things unnecessarily. Um, sometimes runners are guilty of um, oversimplifying things. So if we can meet a middle ground, then that kind of works. Um, right. So there we go. Um, to finish things off, I would encourage you, as always, to check out um, www.runchatlive.com. Um, not only are all my podcasts up there now, you can listen to them on the website, you can watch the videos. If not, there's links to go and see it on Spotify and iTunes and Stitcher and all these other places. Um, there's also um, loads of articles. Um, there's questions and answers to emails that I've had, stuff that I've written for Runners Connect and Running Fitness Magazine and Outdoor Fitness. It's all put up there. So hopefully there's lots of information for the air as well. If you can subscribe, it's free. That's great as well. It just helps give me an indication of how many you are actually um, enjoying and responding to this. If you do subscribe to the website, I will happily send you details of up and coming speakers on Run Chat Live. Um, so it's easier for you to kind of bookmark them as opposed to just waiting for the week before uh, to hear it is. So yeah, runchatlive.com, check it out. Um, thank you as always for joining us. Um, who have we got coming up? Let me just give you a quick kind of idea of, just remind myself, um, where are we? Da, 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 da. Oh, Derek Griffin, that was it. Derek Griffin take two. It's gonna be on June the 2nd. Okay, so June the 2nd for those of you um, who um, missed Derek last time. Um, so put that in the diary, June the 2nd. That's the next time I will see you on One Chat Live. Until then, thank you very much. Adios. Goodbye. You're listening to Run Chat Live podcast.
putting the evidence back into running injury and performance.